read that? All right, you want you want me to want me to send it again to you? Let's uh, let's try it again. Are you copying that in there or are you talking? Now listen carefully. <laughs> uh, I can do it better with this. But... <laughs> Too fast for you? Uh, you see, this... Uh... Uh, I have to, I just have to do this because today I'm, I'm walking along 53rd Street, <laughs> and I'm right in the heart of this very elegant neighborhood, you know, over on the east side, 53rd Street, Park Avenue, all that, you know, jazzy restaurants, elegant girls with poodles, tall, thin young men with uh, cellophane shirts, you know, the whole thing. And uh, I'm walking along in the middle of this, and there's a great mouth of traffic there, a tremendous collection of cars all gathered there. The, the light they were trying to make it across Park Avenue and the horns are going and all of a sudden out of the middle of this cacophony of horns I hear somebody with his horn not only knows CW but he knows how to use it I hear a word that uh, I was the only one probably in the entire block who could read it you know and it, it comes whipping out of me and I turned around and I go <laughs> Because, because CW, if, if, uh, for those of you who don't know what CW is, there is another mode of transmission. Uh, everybody knows what AM means, right? It's not necessarily the name of a juice that's sold in cans for breakfast. AM is what you're listening to us on now. That's called amplitude modulation. Now, I could explain to you what amplitude modulation means. Would you like me to do that tonight? <laughs> I get a blank look from Jerry, not at all interested in what amplitude modulation is. But uh, that's different from FM. Now, I've heard various uh, somewhat uh, obscene uh, definitions of what FM stands for, but the actual, actual meaning is frequency modulation. Now, that's a different type of modulation. Now, it may surprise some of you who are uh, kind of confused about everything that's technical that AM and FM are both forms of radio communication. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm listening to radio. That means they're listening to AM. But then they say, well, no, I don't have a radio on. I got the FM on. <laughs> I've heard that. But they're both radio, and uh, they're both equally ancient. Those of you who might be interested in knowing that, that FM is an old, old form of uh, radio transmission. Uh, contrary to popular misconception, and I'm amazed at the number of misconceptions that popular people have about the technical things. So here you got AM and FM. Well, then now what's the what's another one? All right, TV. Uh, TV, which is television, which is a form of communication that involves both amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. In fact, the the sound on your your television is FM. So when you're listening to the sound of, uh, say, uh, the usual, uh, if you ever really listen to the soundtrack on the average television show, you get a real idea of how dim-witted almost all television is. It's a, in fact, I say calling it a wasteland is to really be complimentary. Uh, wastelands have a certain amount of interest to them. If you've ever been in a true wasteland, like uh, the Black Hills of North Dakota or or in the Sahara Desert, there's a curious beauty to wastelands. Uh, so I say, uh, when they call television a wasteland, they were being complimentary. Uh, I say that uh, <laughs> television is generally a nothing land. It's uh, it's not wasteland. It's not uh, it's not a lush, rich, fertile valley that the green giant lives in. Uh, it's a uh, it's just nothing land. You know, hour after hour, this pablum that comes on and the sound of police sirens. If you notice, the sound of police sirens has uh, has uh, sort of uh, replaced the sound of uh, Colt 44 uh, shot off by riders. Uh, just a few years ago, you turn your TV set on, and the chances were 7 to 1 uh, at any given hour of the day. When you flip the switch on and just stood back and close your eyes, you would immediately hear... That's... <laughs> The thunder of gunfire echoing off the purple hills, right? And the sound of a stagecoach being pursued endlessly across a 21-inch screen 
by these little foreshortened horsemen. And uh, that was what you get. Now, what you get today, though, is that uh, you turn your, your dial on, you wait, you know, you turn the switch on, it warms up, and you close your eyes, and you hear, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is what you're going to hear. Practically every, you might say, uh, every, I mean, about roughly eight out of ten television shows is punctuated by the sound of the police siren. And there's a close-up of the U-light. You know, the red light that goes around on the top of the, t- of the, of the uh, squad car. And uh, there's two patrolmen sitting in there. Uh, they're uh, played usually by Martin Milner or uh, any one of the 15 guys have played. And almost every major performer today plays a cop of one kind or another. So uh, this, this is the current phrase, you know, phase we're going through. However, uh, uh, the sound that brings you this, uh, these great uh, words of, of uh, wisdom and, and uh, cutting wit, uh, you know, I, I, you never can tell, though. I must say that. I mean, you meet all kinds of people today. There's one great thing about uh, living in a major city like New York. You, you meet all kinds of strange, divergent types. Like the other day, I met a guy in the Chalk Full of Nuts who really likes Phyllis Diller. I was made. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I was, and I even met a guy once that liked Toadie Field. So, you know, I say that, uh, you, you pick them up where you find them, you know, and you lay them down where you can. Now, there's another form of transmission, which you probably are not aware of, unless you're a very esoteric type. And that is a form known as CW. Have you ever heard of it, Jerry? AM, FM, TV, and CW. Now, CW is the earliest form, and incidentally, still today, the most widely used worldwide form of radio communication. And there's only a few people who actually hear it constantly, but it is the most generally used wide world form worldwide right it really is and that is what the cw stand for jerry all right i'll tell you it's continuous wave right and it, and the uh, continuous wave is better known uh, to the uh, to the walking around slob on the street as dot and dash or code <laughs> Now, he, he thinks probably that this doesn't exist any longer uh, because uh, you don't see it very often in the movies. You're never going to see a guy sitting there working away with a, with a McElroy bug or, uh, or an electronic key or anything like that. And yet this is a worldwide communication form, which uh, is a separate language in itself. It's a totally complete language. Uh, yeah, I, uh, for example, I will say something to you. I will say a word to you. Listen carefully and see if you can copy this, any of you CW guys out there. <laughs> I will do it again. All right, I will send a word which is the direct opposite of that word. So what I sent to you there was first yes, second no. I will now say another word to you. Uh, just, you know, I'm just picking words out of, out of the air casually. And I will say, uh, I, I will send you an international call sign. Now, this is the kind of language that is used to uh, communicate an idea between two people who do not speak the same language. The great thing about, uh, about CW is that people can have long involved conversations uh, between two nations and not speak a word of the language of either. They have a thing called the international Q signals, sometimes called, uh, if it's the army term, the international Z signals. So here is an international Q sign. I will send you this. <laughs> now that it is understood by a Russian. It's understood by a Japanese. It's understood by a Frenchman. It's understood by uh, a, a guy living in Iceland who speaks only whatever they speak in Iceland. And uh, I have just said... Q-T-H. Now, Q-T-H means my home is. And then you send the name of what your home is after that. So if you happen to live in New York, you would say this. Okay, that says Q-T-H-N-Y. (laughs) <laughs> so a guy listening to you in Murmansk knows exactly where you live. Now, he does not speak uh, English. 
but he does speak the international Q signs. Now that's a that's a, just a you know little thing. And I, I must say this about the, about the CW or code uh, that it's like any form of language. The earlier you learn it, the better you will become. So when you are a tiny kid and you learn CW, let's say at the age of nine or ten, you are fantastic at it. If you try to learn it, let's say if you're, say, 40 years old or 35 or 25, even 25, it's like, I'm telling you, it's like giving birth to a square egg if you're a very small chicken. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy, and, and it's a struggle. And I was lucky. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it happened with me. I was very lucky. One time, uh, I had this, I had this uncle who, uh, who worked for the Long Island, or rather, he worked for the Rock Island Railroad. Did you ever hear of the Rock Island Road? Well, he worked for the Rock Island Road, see, the Chicago Division. And, uh, one of the great weekend tricks and a fantastic treat that would be when my old uncle would take us to his office. Uh, me and my kid brother, see, and we would, we would visit them. They see, we'd be, they lived in Chicago and we would be there having a, a dinner. And, uh, nothing is more boring than, you know, to a seven-year-old kid than to have dinner at the uncle and aunt's, you know, and, and especially if they're elderly. And uh, they got fern plants. And uh, it's in an apartment in the middle of the city where you can't go out and do anything. It's just hot in the apartment. So about halfway through the afternoon, old Uncle Charlie would say, uh, Well, do you want to go down and, and uh, visit the office? Well, you know, we, we'd love to visit the office. How different things have become. But, uh, <laughs> you know, just visiting the office was great. We'd go down to, this, to, the, to the road there, to the yards. And uh, here, here was this fantastic... Uh, it looked like a giant river of railroad tracks. And right in the middle of the railroad tracks was this big building set up there with the tracks that went on either side, big windows they could look out. And, uh, yeah, in the middle of, uh, of all this was my Uncle Charlie's office. A tremendous uh, collection of glass, little glass partitions, and old guys sitting around with green eye shields. And they had these big clocks that, uh, that would just go... You know, the kind of clock that ticks away there. And, uh, this is WOR New York speaking of giant machines. And, uh, oh yes, oh yes, we're a big machine. We are really. And, uh, so we would, we would walk around the office and, and Uncle Charlie would show us, now here's where the, here's where the, uh, man, uh, uh this is the, uh, man who, uh, who uh, controls where all the railroad trains go and he had this big blackboard and you saw all those big names up on it and all the, all the, uh, the numbers of the freight cars, oh, fantastic, complicated stuff. And about halfway down through the, through this collection of, of, of offices, there was a, there was one fantastic office, a whole bunch of guys sitting in there, and, uh, they had all these, all these, uh, these telegraph things going. And, and they were sitting there with keys and stuff, seeing you know, all kinds of papers on their desks, and, and they had, they had the eye shields, and in front of them were these, these, uh, these uh, telegraph clickers, and you'd hear this room. It's going, and these guys are writing stuff down and they're talking to each other. <laughs> and you know, I used to be really fascinated by that as a kid. You know, I said, "Wow, you know what? What are these guys doing?" And uh, Michael Charlie said, "Well, these men are uh, are ace telegraph operators, and uh, they are speaking to men all over the country, and they're telling them that." Uh, uh, when the train is to be expected, what trains are coming in at 237, and that the uh, 422 L&M uh, Peoria Limited just went through, and uh, they're doing all these things, and they're talking to men all over the country. And you'd see these guys sitting there working away to Key, see, and having this great time. Well, I was about, I would say at the time, I couldn't have been, I would say even almost preschool. I would say probably five, six, seven, at, at the very latest seven. And uh, this made a fantastic impression on me. Well, then, you know, time went on, and uh, I was about eight now, and I had a birthday. Do you remember your birthdays when you were a kid at all? And the other great moments in your life, you know, and, and, and I was having this birthday. I was about eight, and uh, it was on a Sunday afternoon, and it, my birthday usually fell in the middle of the week, and nothing ever really happened except I got a present and a cake and that stuff. But here it is, all of a sudden, it's on Sunday. Well, it just so happened that this was also a Sunday afternoon when my Uncle Charlie and my Aunt Glenn were coming over to visit us. Well, uh, they came over there, 
and we had a cake, you know, I was having my birthday, and everybody sat around and sang happy birthday and stuff. And so finally, Uncle Charlie says, uh, well, I uh, have uh, brought along a little gift for you. And he had this wrap package with paper. With Well, at that time, I was deep in my yo-yo phase. You know, I figured it was a, a new uh, competition, Dunkin' Yo-Yo, something like that. And I opened the thing up, and I could not believe it. It was one of the most absolutely creative gifts. I still remember this gift more than any other gift I've ever received in my entire life. Most creative gift I've ever gotten. Uncle Charlie gave me a telegraph key. Not only did he give me a telegraph key, a real one. He gave me a telegraph key from the from the long or rather from the Rock Island Railroad. A real telegraph key, a real sidewinder, see, and uh, the real classical key. Well, uh, I, I got this key, see, and I was I was dumbfounded, I was astounded, see. And he said, "Well, he said, um, I'll show you." Uh, he says, now I will uh, show you how to work this key. I'll give you, he says, now here's the way you hold it. And I'm eight, you know, and he, he shows me how to hold it. And there's an absolutely correct way to hold a key. If you don't, if you don't know how to uh, hold that key and use your wrist the right way, uh, you'll forever be a slow, laborious CW man. So here I'm eight, I don't know anything, and, and here a guy who was an expert was telling me and showing me how to do it. Incidentally, my Uncle Charlie had been an ex-telegraph operator, and he was now a big guy in the traffic department there, see? But he really knew uh, telegraph, so he takes my hand, he shows me how to do it, and he says, now, uh, I will show you how to do this. He says, uh, well, let us uh, go down to the uh, store and buy a, a dry cell battery, at which point we went down to the store and we bought this dry cell, and he came back, and, and he had the clicker with him. You know, that came with this, this, the whole gift came with, you know, a key with a clicker and a whole bit, see? So he hooks this thing up with bell wire, and he starts sending this continental morse. Now, that's called continental morse. Continental morse is not the kind they use on international radio communications. This is used for uh, telegraph communications between points, and it's called continental morse. And it consists of a series of clicks, not dots and dashes, but clicks. Like that, see? where the spacing between the clicks is more important than anything else. So he says, I will now show you how to do this. And so we're sending these things back, and he teaches me a few letters, and he shows me how to hold the key. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, I was really deeply involved in this. Uh, do you want to hear more about this? Because it changed my whole life. Before we go any further, will you hit the DuVernay aperitif button, please? You don't have to know a lot about wines. To know the time for DuVernay is before. Before, that's the time to think about some Dubonnet to drink. Before's the proper time of day to have yourself a Dubonnet. Before, yeah, before. It's the time before for Dubonnet. Dubonnet. Some people can't spell it, and there's hardly a soul who knows it's an aperitif. But don't let that scare you away. All you need to know is this. Dubonnet's the wine that's made to go before lunch, before dinner. Just pour it over the rocks, add a twist, soda if you like. That's Dubonnet before, made to make what comes after that much better. Before, yeah, before. It's the time before for Dubonnet. Dubonnet Company, New York, New York. Yes, Sabina Belgian World Airlines has an urgent announcement for young types. Travelers who plan to go to Europe this summer after the 27th of June, the present 200... Now, remember the date. After the 27th, the present $220 youth fare to Europe will no longer be available. That means any airline. The very next day, June 28th, youth fare will go up to $263. And there will be, moreover, no more youth fare for 24 and 25 year olds. And no eligibility for students, that's students, up to age 29. However, the $220 youth fare will apply on every Sabina flight to Europe right up to the 9.45 p.m. departure on the 27th of June. And you can return any time within a year. So by flying Sabina up until the 27th, you'll save $43. And at won't hurt with the way the dollar is going over in Europe. So, to see your travel agent, uh, if you do that, then they'll tell you all about it, 27th, or call Sabina Belgian World Airline for the further details. The number is area code 212 961 
And uh, as long as we're doing commercials, we might as well lay a goodie on you here about our old friends at 52nd and 7th, the House of Chan, a superb Chinese restaurant. And uh, it's, a, it's a real New York uh, landmark there, the House of Chan. They've been there for 35 years. And anybody that can cut it for 35 years right in the middle of Manhattan in the Times Square area is doing something right. <laughs> I'm telling you, believe me. Uh, if you know much about restaurants in New York, you know that almost all of the great restaurants of that period when they started 35 years ago have long since departed. And it's a fine restaurant. They're at the corner of 52nd and 7th, and they have a fantastic menu. I mean, it goes on like the Sears Roebuck catalog. And uh, the food is always fixed hot and fresh for you. And incidentally, if you're going to a show, because that's right in the show area there, 52nd Street and 7th Avenue, and it's right, right down the street from all the Broadway theaters, if you're going to a show, tell them uh, when you go in for dinner, and they'll be sure that you get it on time to make the theater. They have a good bar there, and they're open seven days a week until midnight. So that's fair enough. That even includes Sunday. So if you're coming in over the weekend, any one of these great New York weekends, and by the way, this is the time of the year to come into New York on the weekend. It's practically empty. Uh, you'll have a good time. Uh, make it to the House of Chan, 7th Avenue and 52nd. Now, I don't know why I'm telling you this thing here tonight. This is just absolutely off the top of my head. I had a totally different show planned, but I, I heard that CW this afternoon on 53rd Street. It hit me, you know. I said, man, I, I, I just, somebody else in that car. It was, done, it was sent deliberately, by the way. I could tell that. It wasn't just an accidental series of sounds. This guy actually was telling the world what he thought of it in CW. And a few ears picked it up. Uh, it, it, by the way, this is something that you may not be aware of, but you'll occasionally hear this. Uh, for example, I know of at least three or four pieces of music, pop-type music, where somebody has thrown in a CW phrase in the background that either the trumpet or often a guitar plays. And you'll hear it come winging out of, the, <laughs> out of the radio and say, you know that it's a secret message for anybody who can copy CW. So if you think that this is a dead language, forget it, man. It's you that's dead. <laughs> I mean, the language is going all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a very valid language. And, and, uh, and I, at, at the age of eight, see, I was walking into something that literally changed my entire life. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very serious. I'm being very... I, don't, I know I've never told this story ever on the air, and I'm not... I'm not involving myself in nostalgia or trivia, but you know, I'd like to say this, that I've often wondered when I see people walking around the streets doing things like an accountant or a, or a guy that's a dentist or somebody that's, uh, that's uh, any profession, uh, an airline pilot or somebody that paints signs, how they originally started this thing, how it actually began. And I think that the beginnings of anybody's career are so shrouded in, in time and in the mists of uh, the amorphous way that things happen that there's no one moment where a guy says, Aha! Eureka! I have got it! I will be, I will be a veterinarian! No. It, uh, it, <laughs> it, it slowly begins to develop, and then the next thing you know, the guy's there giving aspirins to turtles and stuff. And... Uh, how, how it happened is very difficult to, 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 you know, to know. Well, I'll tell you, this is a true story. And, and I, I was about eight, and my, my uncle gave me this key. Well, it was a, it was a, a genuine code CW key and uh, a classic, what they call a sidewinder, uh, which is a, a real fine key. And it's a, it's a, key that was used on the, the telegraph systems all around the country and incidentally is still in use. That type of key is used uh, worldwide. It's a classic form. And here I had this key. Well, I was obviously the only one in the neighborhood that owned anything like this. And, uh, and I played around with this thing. Well, then it slowly began to evolve that uh, I, at the same time, was a member of a Cub Scout troop. Remember, this is all these things go together, see? <laughs> and I, I, had, I did not make any really overt moves to learn CW, uh, but I had the key, and I knew how to use it. I had been taught by my Uncle Charlie how to use the key. And I was really only about eight or nine. 
which means that I was just at the right age to learn another language without a without much trouble, really. Well, here I was. I was a, a Cub Scout, and they had all these little, you know, you could earn uh, various types of uh, merit badges and stuff. See, so I discovered that there was <laughs> there was a merit badge for for radio communication code. You had to learn the code, so you get a you get a merit badge uh, called radio or something like that. It was called communication, something of that type. And uh, we had this uh, Cub Scout handbook, and it had the code in it. Yes, it had the code in it, but this was the International Morse Code, which is not the same as the Click Code, but the Morse Code. And uh, I, I, I found out how to get a, you could get a buzzer. You could actually buy a buzzer at the dime store at Woolworth. You buy a, the, the kind of buzzer that is really a, tel- it's really a, a buzzer for doorbells. It's a little round buzzer, you know, uh, is all it went. And it ran off of dry cell batteries. So I bought a buzzer. I connected it up to the key through the batteries. And that was the first moment that began an entire era in my life. I pressed the key, you know, and it goes, uh, like that. Uh, and I'd, re- I'd, I'd pick the key up and it would stop buzzing. So every time I would press the key, it would go, uh, 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 I could get these great sounds. Well, there was the code there in front of me uh, in a printed form. Now, I was doing this all on my own, remember? There was nobody else around who could who could teach me how to learn this thing or anything. And, and uh, so I began to send the letters. The first one was an A, of course, which was a dot and a dash. Dip, da, more properly, but uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it was a dot and a dash. So I go, ah, ah. Well, I'm 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 struggling away there, and and the B was, uh, 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 right. The C, uh, 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 D, uh, 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 E, uh, F, uh, 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 G, uh, 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 H, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, J. Uh, 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 L. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I always like to send that one. Uh, 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 uh. M. Uh, uh, N. Uh, uh. O. Uh, 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 uh. P. Uh, 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 uh. That's a goodie. I'll send that again for you. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> L-O-P-Q. Uh, 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 uh. That's a nice one, too. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, L-O-Q. J-K, L-O-Q. Come on, now. That's right. Now listen to this one. Uh, 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 R. S. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. T. Uh, U. Uh, uh, uh. And, of course, everybody knows V. World War II made V famous. <laughs> so did Beethoven. Uh, 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 uh. Y. Uh, 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 uh. X. Uh, 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 uh. Z. Uh, 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 uh. There it is. The alphabet, see? Well, now, learning the alphabet's one thing. Learning how to use the alphabet's another. <laughs> so, so I'm struggling away there, see? This is, goes on day after day. And on maybe a month later, and I have really learned how to send this code back and forth. I could send all these different, these different words, and or I was, you know, pulling words out of the hat and sending them back and forth to myself, of course, see, driving the entire family crazy because of all the buzzes and beeps and sounds I'm making around there. I'm eight years old, you know, and so <laughs> one Sunday we're going to go visit Uncle Charlie again. See? So I take my key and I put it all in a, in a bag and I put the batteries into the buzzer and we go up to we go up to Chicago. And I'm going to really surprise my Uncle Charlie, see. So he, he, uh, we sit down and, and we have the dinner. And, and after the dinner, uh, I, I had a big surprise. And I says, Uncle Charlie, I have a big surprise. And he says, what is it? And I take out my key. And he says, oh, I see you have your key. He says, what's that you got to you? And I said, I've got it hooked to a buzzer now. Now listen to what I do. So I go, uh, 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 u
I'm saying B, see, and I go, ah, uh, it, ah, uh, it. <laughs> he says, say, that's, that's great. He said, there. he says, now I'm going to show you how to do it. And he takes the key and he goes, ah, 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 Oh, fantastic. He says, now, here, he says, I'm going to teach you something. Never listen to it in the form of dot dash. That's where you're making a mistake. It's always da-da. And listen to it as a unit. Don't think of it as A, B, C. Hear the whole word. So if you if if you hear da 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 da, da you don't hear T H E. That's the. So think of it that way. It's, oh. Well, being eight, that kind of stuff comes real easy. That's the stuff that throws the guy that's thirty five that's trying to learn it. <laughs> now we're getting very complex. Well, after that, it was it was fantastic. So the next the next thing that happened after I I learned to send and receive code, I was knocking it off maybe. 13, 15 words a minute now. Yeah, all to myself. I'm estimating it now. So, on one fantastic Christmas, my my old man, uh, I don't know where he heard about this, but he he heard from some guy down at the work where, where he worked that uh, that you should get a shortwave radio to really listen to the code. See, I got a shortwave radio as a Christmas gift. And it was like a fantastic new world opened up to me. An incredible new world. I, I, you know, I get this radio set up, and they put an antenna out on the roof there, and the next thing I know, this stuff is coming out of the speaker. And not only coming out of the speaker, but I can understand it. So I'm sitting there writing this down, and I'm getting news. To, <laughs> I'm getting everything. See, I'm listening to ships, and I'm writing all this stuff down. And, and within, I would say, within a month or a month and a half, something like that, I, I was sending and receiving. This is what was, what was more important. It's easy to send. It was receiving. I was receiving probably 20 to 25 words a minute, which is really fast. Although I didn't know it because it was working in a vacuum. I didn't know uh, what kind of an achievement this was. And at that point, of course, it began to go through my head over and over and over again. I could hear code in my sleep. When I walked down the street, I could hear horns blowing. I could hear him saying stuff. I'm, every place, you hear a window go up and it creaks, and you hear code coming out of it. You know, uh, you you hear you know you hear somebody uh, chewing their gum, and you hear code coming out of that. Everything you heard, yeah, you know, oh yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, these random sounds make sense when you actually know what they mean. So uh, I, I'm, I'm tuning around the band one day, and this is what changed my whole existence. I'll never forget it. I, I usually I listened uh, I listened on about uh, roughly. Mm, I would say uh, the frequencies I was li really listening to was about eight megacycles because there was a lot of commercial operation on that on that frequency and it was actually the hottest band for my receiver. I had a little cheap CW or a little crummy. Uh, it was a little regenerative short wave set with plug-in coils. And one afternoon, however, uh, I'm tuning around in this thing and I heard my first amateurs. I mean, here were guys talking back and forth with code just sitting around having this groovy time, you know? And they were sitting there talking back and forth. Well, that was the end of the ball game for me. Uh, from that minute on, <laughs> I became I became a totally dedicated kid. And and uh, within a year, I not only I not only had gotten my my amateur license, I was also I, I, I had a class A license. I went up, oh, you haven't heard the end of it. I had a second-class commercial CW ticket. I went up for the whole works. I was really dedicated, see. And and here, by the age of 15, that's right, by the age of 15, I I held a, a, a RRL certificate of a 45-word-a-minute, a five-minute, unbroken copy record. So I was dedicated, man. And I, I, you know, CW to me was my life. I could hear it. And all the while I remember this, I was carrying on a totally uh, normal life outside of that. This was a secret world in my front bedroom. In addition to that, I was playing a pretty fair second base, and I was playing, you know, because most kids, unfortunately, only do one. They get involved in radio or something, and that's it. The rest of the world out there can stop. But uh, I was not doing that. And so this, this whole thing began to get a great, great grip on me. Well... Uh, CW today, and, and it was at that time, it remained at that time, is normal to me uh, as hearing somebody speak plain English. Uh, so, so I can, I can, <laughs> and I always, I always, I take it so much for granted now, 
uh, and always did, because, you know, remember, after all, I learned it at the age of eight, roughly, that I'm always surprised when I discover that people around me have no comprehension of this. It's like, it's like running into a friend of yours and he can't speak English. You know, you, you, you don't know what to say to him. Uh, and, and so I hear CW all the time. In any one of the movies where you see a guy sitting there operating code or a code comes out of the loudspeaker or something, I copy all this. You'd be surprised at the number of times that the CW that is used in a movie has nothing whatsoever to do with the message they claim it was sending. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, so code and, and this language is a universal language, and it's used today probably more than ever before, actually. Uh, it's used in all kinds of uh, various techniques around the world and uh, in all sorts of uh, curious installations and worldwide communications and so on. And there's a growing body of amateurs, again, that are using it more and more, see. So anyway, this led to one of the most uh, exotic army experiences that I ever had. That, uh, to, to me, this was as close to anything that I've ever seen out of Catch-22. Now, have you read Catch-22, right? Well, I'd say that this is a pale, uh, often badly written imitation of the real thing. Because uh, the real army life was, was, was so much more exotic. Than, uh, than the kind of uh, precious life that Yosarian lived. I mean, really much different. I was in a company, see, and uh, Company K, and all these guys, every every last, almost every last one of them uh, was was a licensed ham, uh, and and many of them had commercial tickets, including myself, commercial CW tickets as well as radio phone tickets. At the time I held the first phone, and uh, and a second CW. If any of you know that commercial. So, and the only reason I didn't hold the first commercial was because the first commercial required uh, a year or two, or I don't recall what the, yeah, something like a year or two of actual sea duty or uh, uh, commercial usage of the license, but the same requirements. So here I am, all these guys are, are, are ACW operators. Well, we had been assigned, we were in radar, which has nothing to do with CW, see, but we were in radar, highly trained radar men. And uh, we'd been in radar now for about a year, really trained in, in one of the most esoteric fields in all the armed services. We were not necessarily, no, we were not operators, which is an easy thing to train. We were a highly qualified maintenance, installation, and troubleshooting unit, which, <laughs> which is something else. I, sometime I'm going to do a show about the final exam in this highly qualified radar unit, the final exam that each man had to pass to be qualified as a signal core qualified high-powered radar, radar transmitter keyer antenna specialist. It's fantastic uh, final exam. The final exam, well, I'll tell that's another story. It's a, it's a, what, a, what a great night that was. But uh, we were qualified. A highly esoteric and extremely valuable field. There is never too many radar maintenance, installation, and troubleshooting experts. A guy that can walk up to a $7 million piece of equipment and in a half an hour have it running like new. That is a man to be reckoned with. And that's exactly what you're listening to tonight, gang. So, <laughs> I mean, and so we, we, uh, we were we were we were this uh, company of, of maintenance and, and repair and troubleshooting experts, with scope experts. Incidentally, my particular expertise was involved in the high power transmitter, as well as the scope. Uh, we had a, we had a guys who were specialists in the power supplies. We had guys who were spe specialists in transmission lines, and uh, all the rest of it down the line. See, and without any warning, this is the army. We, they had trained us for a whole year. We're about to to, to be put into actual use. We've, we've been sent to microwave technique schools in the University of Chicago. We've been sent to secret schools in the middle of great forests out in the Midwest. We've been sent to all kinds of esoteric schools. And now we're graduated. One year. And without any warning, we are all transferred to basic training. We were dumbfounded. And we were sent to this basic training unit, and, and, and a PFC is interviewing us on what we wanted to be in the Army. And so somebody says, well, how come we're over radar? He says, radar has been transferred out of the signal car. It's now in the Air Force. 
I said, why don't you translate? Well, that's too much paperwork. <laughs> so overnight, we are all sent to a low-speed code school. Five words a minute code. And every one of us was an expert. And here we were, surrounded by thousands of clods who had just gotten in the Army about six days before, and they're learning the very basic rudiments of low-speed field CW operation. This is true cannon fodder in the, in the infantry. Another you know, guy that signals, we are lost, send replacements, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so they started to send the CW, and we had agreed, we're not going to learn CW. And so... All of us sat there day after day with earphones, unable to copy five words a minute. And they keep sending us this code. We couldn't get it. And all the other classes that went in with us are now all the way up to 25 words a minute. And we're there eight weeks, and we still can't take five words a minute, the entire class. And I remember the day that the major walked in. The major walked into the code school, and he, he had a loudspeaker. And he says, I want to say this to you. I can teach code to a dog. This entire company can't even take five words a minute yet. You guys been here eight weeks. You can't even copy an A. Well, I can teach code to a dog. And we all look very serious. We, we just can't understand this stuff. And then he went on further. I see on your record that all you guys got amateur radio licenses. You guys have got commercial licenses. And you can't take code now. Gee, I don't know. We all forgot it. Just forgot it. This went on another four weeks. I think we were all transferred to the Air Force, en masse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you mind if I... <laughs> I just said something to your friends. So, uh, be of good cheer. And remember this. There are many things in the air that you do not understand. There's a lot of messages being picked up and received that you have no comprehension. You're not as smart as you think, friends. <laughs>